Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Julian De Freitas. He is a cognitive scientist in the Department of Psychology at Harvard University. He studies social intelligence with a focus on the self, strategic thinking and ethics. So, Dr. De Freitas, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thanks for having me. It's fun, yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically today we're going to talk a little bit about the self, the relationship between the self and morality and toward the end, common knowledge. So st starting with the self, first of all, because I guess uh, I, sometimes I try to wrap my head around this concept of the self and I've already talked about it on the show with philosophers and social psychologists and people like that. But for you, as a cognitive scientist, what is really the self? What, what what are we talking about here? Yeah, so as you pointed out, it's a pretty complicated topic. And I think that there's a scientific definition of the self, which people still have not settled on, and which I think philosophers are still arguing about. Um, but, you know, I think broadly the scientific view says that there are multiple systems in the brain, each of which is dedicated to processing different kinds of information. And, you know, together they comprise the self. I'm so much not interested in that question. I'm interested in how people think about the self um, and, and how they, uh, you know, represent it at, at the level of, uh, you know, cognitive uh, modules. So for me, you know, what I study is when, when people are asked about the self or when they think about the self, you know, what definition do they have in mind? Um, so most of the work that we've done involves asking people questions or um, telling them to associate items with their selves and then seeing how they behave um, as a result of that. Yeah. Okay, so you're not so much interested in trying to know if what we call the self is something that is really out there that really exists but rather how people think about the self and probably about themselves and other people right yeah exactly and this you could say it falls within the realm of intuitive psychology yeah. um in some cases when you're measuring behavior you are in the realm of also perceptual psychology and attention. Um, but yeah, throughout it's measuring the results of what happens when people associate something with themselves. And I think that there are real processes that are happening. We have a bunch of findings and other people too showing that there's something special about calling something yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there are certain phenomena that seem to uniquely occur when people do that but yeah the other question as to like what the self is at a sort of global objective level um i i try to steer clear from that question <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess it's also more of a philosophical one so uh and now i mean to talk when people think about morality and how we and other people should behave in society and things like that. Uh, I mean, we think about ourselves and other people as agents, in this case, moral agents. So we immediately attribute a self to ourselves and to other people. So what is really the relationship? What would you say is the relationship between the self or how people think about the self and m morality and moral behavior? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. And there are probably a number of things that could be said about the relationship between being perceived as an agent and moral treatment. Um, I guess, at least in my own research, one connection that we found that's quite interesting is that when people are reasoning about whether someone is still the same person through changes in their lives, then they seem to think that 
moral traits are especially essential to that person's identity, such that if that person loses, especially in a dramatic way, their morally good traits, then in some sense, they're no longer the same person anymore. Um, so a great example of this is the Phineas Gage scenario, um, which, of course, was inspired by a real event in which someone named Phineas Gage uh, was working, um, and I think dynamite basically triggered a tempering iron to penetrate his skull. And people described him as being mostly you know, still functioning, but he had lost a lot of his moral traits, so much so that his family said he was no longer the same person anymore. Yeah. And we find this basic effect um, in a number of controlled studies as well, where if someone is initially morally good and they lose those traits, people think that that person's no longer the same person. And we find this across a couple of cultures as well. Even if you're someone who is a misanthrope, so you mostly have negative predictions about others, you still seem to think that deep down people are good. Um, so it might be that this is a phenomenon related to essentialism, mm -hmm. where people distinguish between your surface traits, so what you show the world, and the sort of essential traits that are really what make up your identity. And it might be that morality is one of those traits. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is moral judgment, particularly from a cognitive science perspective? I mean, what are uh, sort of the traits that people put to use when they morally judge other people and themselves and things like that? Yeah, I think moral judgment is a pretty high level judgment, by which I mean To make a moral judgment about someone, you already have to be keeping track of various concepts mm -hmm. about what you're seeing. So you need to know, first of all, who the agents are. Um, then you need to keep track of who did what to whom, um, so causality. And you need to keep track of, okay, was there harm at all? Or was it a neutral interaction, you know, just two people uh, talking over cards? Um, and you need to know what were the intentions? Was this person accidentally bumping the other one or was it really a, a, an intentional, you know, hitting them with the baton? Mm -hmm. So I think moral judgment is a high level judgment that incorporates all of those different pieces of um, conceptual uh, knowledge to spit out a final judgment ab about a person and basically direct blame toward that person. Mm -hmm. And um, more broadly, this is useful because, as I think many people, many scholars would agree, we need morality to coordinate social life. So morality is kind of like the traffic light uh, on the roads. You know, we need some kind of system that we can all appeal to when deciding who should be blamed and, and who should not. Yeah. And uh, uh, still regarding moral judgment, there's this interesting phenomenon called the optimality bias. Could you tell us about mm. it? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, this was work done with uh, a colleague at England, uh, Sam Johnson. And we were interested in the optimality bias because it's very different from what most people have been studying with regards to moral judgment. So, Most studies on moral judgment look at the role of mental states on your moral judgment. So, for instance, if you intentionally want to do something or if you knowingly do it, you're more blameworthy than if you do it accidentally or, you know, mistakenly. Um, but uh, we were interested in this idea that people still will blame others more even when they could not possibly have had any knowledge about the wrongness of what they were doing. So um, specifically, we were inspired by the um, earthquake situation in Italy where um, there were a couple of scientists who were trialed for many years. That was the initial sentence, I think. They were going to be put in prison for failing to predict an earthquake. 
And um, the scientific community was outraged by this because it's actually, um, in that case, it was effectively impossible, I think, to predict it. Mm -hmm. So we were interested in this possibility, which is that maybe people blame you more if you don't make the optimal choice, even if at the time there's no possible way that you could have known that it was the optimal choice. So in our experiments, for instance, we told people about doctors who had three possible treatment options. You know, one might have a 30% chance of success, another one 50, another one 70. And then we tell them that the doctor chose the one that has a 50% uh, chance or a 30% chance. And what we find is that if they, if they don't choose the best, the optimal choice, then they get blamed a lot. People don't care so much if you choose one of the suboptimal ones, but they care a lot if you don't choose the best one. And in various experiments, we try to really convince people that there was no way the doctor could know. Um, they were doing the best that they could with the information that they had. But it seems like it doesn't matter to people. If you make the suboptimal choice, you're going to be blamed. Yeah. Uh, and since we are talking about people's intuitions mostly and what we could call, I guess, folk psychology, right? What are some of the intuitions that people have about the moral nature of the self, just to go back and connect morality with the self? I mean, do people think that we are essentially good or bad or what exactly? Yeah, so this connects a lot to what I was briefly sort of highlighting, which is this work we've been doing on the true self And um, it seems that when people refer to the true self, um, you know, they're specifically referring to the parts of themselves that they view as being most valuable and most um, essential to who they are. And um, what we find is that they specifically have in mind moral goodness. So it seems as though people do think that deep down at the most essential level that they and others are morally good. Now, of course, what you think is morally good depends on your values. So for instance, in America, you know, there's people with liberal and conservative values, for instance. And um, in our experiments and in that of others, we find that people think that the true self of others is specifically what they think is good. So for instance, if you tell liberals and conservatives about someone who has um, homosexual desires, but preaches to others that homosexuality is wrong, then the liberals are more likely to think that the true self of that person is his desires, and the conservatives are more likely to think that it's the belief that um, those desires are wrong. Um, so, so that's one caveat. But um, what's really interesting about the true self is we've also found that it predicts judgments about a person that would seem to have nothing to do with the true self. So, um, you know, if, for instance, someone is, um, is showing what philosophers call weakness of will. So they decided to do something, but then the next day they went against it. It turns out that those judgments are predicted by how you view that person's true self. So if I decided not to do a bad thing, like um, not to gamble, but the next day, despite my decision, I gambled, then people will say that, you know, I showed weakness of will. Um, and it turns out that the reason they think that is because deep down in my true self, I don't want to gamble. So, um, you know, by just by going against my decision, I was kind of ignoring my true self. But now if you flip it, if you say that you showed weakness of will toward a good thing. So for instance, I decided I'm not going to donate to this charity because I've given too much money already. And then the next day I say, look, you know, I'm, I just, I have to help them. Now people are less likely to say that you showed weakness of will, even though at a sort of philosophical level, the same thing has happened. You decided not to do something, and then the next day you change your mind. And the reason it seems is that because in one case, 
you're expressing your true self. So when you do the good thing, it's fine. You're, you're just being who you truly are. But when you do the bad thing, you're going against that true self. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, I mean, can we say that people overall think that our true self is of, of good nature or, or not? Yeah, I think at least the studies that we have suggest that this view is correct. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to expect you to behave in a morally good fashion. So for instance, we find in intergroup context that when people show intergroup biases, so they find the other group more threatening or um, they have more negative attitudes toward that group, even though they have those beliefs, if you tell them that that person used to do these good things and then changed to being a terrible person, they're more likely to say that that change no longer reflects the person's true self. Mm -hmm. So it seems that people can have these negative views of others and at the same time still believe that, you know, deep down they're still good. So it might be that people think that in some cases you go astray. So you have a good nature, but then maybe you get corrupted by others or your culture. Um, but this is definitely an interesting puzzle. You know, how can people have such, you know, positive beliefs about your essence, but then still behave so terribly with respect to certain people? Yeah, that's really interesting. And uh, I mean, morality also relates to other aspects of our psychology, like, for example, happiness. What is the role that morality and moral behavior and someone feeling like a good person plays in their happiness? I mean, in, their, in them being happy or not with their lives? Yeah, this is a really interesting um, question. So... One thing is that when you ask a psychologist, according to them, to be happy, you, it's all about the mental states you have. So you just need to have a high positive affect and a you know, low negative affect, high life satisfaction. If you have all of those, you're happy. But philosophers for a long time have talked about an additional component, which is that you must be living a morally good life. Mm -hmm. So... We don't disagree with psychologists. Um, we think that, you know, if you have those mental states, you are truly happy. But nonetheless, we were curious what people's intuitive beliefs are. So it might be that actually the philosophers are right as far as people's intuitions about happiness go. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way that we looked at this was we told people about someone who they had all of the psychological criteria for happiness, but the one missing thing was that they were living a morally bad life. So for instance, we told people about a, fame, a, a person who only hangs out with other people if they're famous and you know they're always doing some kind of drug and they never stay in touch with their family or friends. Uh, but you know they still feel great and they have very high life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that people thought that that person was less happy than another person who had all the same psychological states but was a morally good person. So, you know, they stayed in touch with their family. They were always trying to do something for their children and so forth. So um, at least as far as, you know, our intuitions go, it seems like morality is important, that the philosophers are correct. Now, the natural question is why? And again, and I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to keep referring to the true self, um, the true self explains this as well. So when you ask people about the first kind of person who's living a morally bad life, you know, just trying to be a celebrity, people are more likely to agree with the statement that deep down this person actually feels very differently about their lives. So they think that the happiness that the person exhibits is just superficial. Um, whereas they think that the person is living a morally good life is not exhibiting superficial happiness, but real happiness. So it might be that if you're living a morally good life and you're happy, then people view that happiness as an expression of your inner goodness. But if you're living a morally bad life and you're happy, then people 
think of your life as conflicting with your inner goodness. And so that undermines the happiness that you exhibit, which people just view as being superficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, what about the meaning of life? We, we've talked about happiness, but there's also this connection that people make a lot of the time between happiness or having or living a happy life and feeling that the life is also meaningful in some way. So could, could you tell us about that as well? Yeah, of course. Um, so meaning uh, of life, I think, is really interesting in some ways because it's maybe even more high level than happiness and morality. So some philosophers have argued about what makes a meaningful life. So do you just need to be very happy or do you, uh, so those are called the subjectivists, um, or do you need to be contributing to the world, doing something that adds value? Those are called the objectivists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I think maybe more interestingly, there are people who think that you need both to be happy. So for instance, um, there are some philosophers like Susan Wolf who said that you can only be living a, a meaningful life. I mean, if you're adding value to the world by doing something that you love. Yeah. And if you have both of those, then your life is meaningful. So one thing that we did um, is we asked, again, everyday people, what do they think makes someone's life meaningful? And interestingly, we found a view that doesn't fit quite neatly in any of the philosophical views, where we find that if someone is happy, then people think that their life is more meaningful than if they're not happy. If they're adding objective value to the world, again, people think, yes, you know, this person has a meaningful life compared to someone who's not adding value. And if they are both happy and they add value to the world, then their life is viewed as most meaningful of all. So we find that each of the ingredients on its own does increase the attributed meaningfulness of a life. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> at the same time, if you have both, then you're viewed as having an especially meaningful life. And again, relating it to morality, um, if you're doing, if you're not just doing something objectively valuable in a general sense, but if it's specifically in a moral sense, like you're donating to charities or helping others in some other way, then that's viewed as particularly um, a good way to increase the meaningfulness of your life, uh, at least according to people's uh, intuitions. So again, I just want to say that, you know, here I'm kind of, again, like with the self, I'm, I'm not trying to tell people what a meaningful life is. I'm just studying people's intuitions about it. But I think it's still interesting, even when we're thinking about what a meaningful life is, to consider this sort of, scientific data in terms of people's intuitions yeah yeah okay so let's now move on to talking about common knowledge this is a very very interesting topic in social psychology and other branches of psychology and cognitive science so <coughs> first, first of all before we get into the nitty-gritty of it what is common knowledge really yeah <clears throat> so technically common knowledge is when you know that I know that you know that I know in, ad infinitum about something. So, you know, there was a car crash and we both know that we both know that. And on the game theoretic definition, we need to have infinite um, recursive beliefs about the, the event for it to be common knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I mean, but is common knowledge does common knowledge work just between two people or can it be a collective of people? It can be a collective, yeah. So, um, you know, you can believe that everybody else believes, that you believe, that they believe and so forth, that um, there is an emergency outside and uh, that someone should help. So, you know, this this is a common knowledge is a quite broad um Sort of idea that applies across both individuals and groups yeah mm -hmm. so and since you also study strategic thinking uh, 
Uh, what is the relationship or the role that common knowledge plays in things like coordinating behavior between different people and strategic mentalizing? Yeah, so in game theory, it's long been noted that you need common knowledge to coordinate with others because if you don't have common knowledge, there's a good chance that you're not going to be able to coordinate. So, for instance, today we had to coordinate to do this interview. And if I believed that you thought that I might not be here, then, you know, um, I... I might not show up because I think you're not going to show up. And, and I might think that you're not going to show up because you think I'm not going to show up and, and so forth. So to coordinate, we need some level of strategic thinking. And what game theorists have noted is that the problem of recursive beliefs potentially, um, you know, not being completely fulfilled, you know, like me believing that you might believe that I won't show up can multiply and we can never coordinate. So what we need to have is full-blown common knowledge where we both know that we both know. Um, and so, you know, a lot of what our work was doing was to see to what extent is this true in human psychology and how do people solve this problem in, you know, in actual psychology? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, I mean, and also we have to know that other people know that we know and add infinitum because if we aren't sure that someone knows about something, then that person might take some sort of advantage because she can just say, oh, I didn't know about that. It's not my fault, not my responsibility. And that's also because uh, that's also the reason why we have agreements and contracts and all of that right because someone could just slip it away and say okay so i, I didn't know about this not my fault right yeah exactly i think contracts effectively create common knowledge um everybody has to sign in the same place so there's no reasonable uh room for doubt about whether one person didn't know what the other knew and what you said about taking advantage is really true. So, you know, um, we studied this with respect to something known as the bystander effect, which I'm sure you know about, which yeah. is that if there are, you know, many people around, then each of them is less likely to help than if they're the only person there. And the, the typical, if you open an introduction to psychology textbook, the explanation that they will give you is that the responsibility that any individual normally feels is diffused across mm -hmm. the total number of people. But the problem with that explanation is that it's kind of vague as to what diffusion is and when it occurs. Um, you know, what, what it, it sounds like a very automatic kind of phenomenon. And so our thought was actually that so it's not just some automatic diffusion, but people are strategically thinking about what everyone else knows. So what we did is we created bystander situations where, for instance, I imagine, for instance, that, um, you know, we, we both live in the same building and someone has to go fix the geezer. Otherwise, the landlord is going to make us all pay a higher rent. Um, and imagine that. I see the landlord speak to you and remind you, hey, someone needs to fix the geezer. And I can see that you didn't see me see you. <laughs> then I might think, look, you know, Ricardo's going to fix it because he thinks he's the only one who knows. And he knows that if no one helps, then we're all going to get fined. So I'm not going to help. Conversely, you know, if I, if, um, if I know that you know that I saw you do, saw you being told by the the landlord. Then this in this case, I'm less sure of whether you know you're going to help because you might think I'm going to help. And so we found this, you know, when we put people in these situations, whether or not they help is not only a matter of how many other people there are. It's it's driven a lot by what they believe everybody knows, and mm -hmm. also about what they believe the other people know about what they know and so forth. And we found this even up to uh, quaternary knowledge. So 
quite a lot of recursive uh, beliefs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's a more fine-grained explanation than just saying, as social psychologists used to say, that it was simply a diffusion of responsibility among all the people that were there, right? Yeah, because um, in in some ways, the strategic explanation encompasses the previous findings and predicts findings that that account cannot account for. So in the standard social psychological bystander effect, everybody has common knowledge. You know, there's an emergency and we're all there. Um, But in the situations we looked at, we also looked at some where it's not common knowledge. You know, you might know, or the other person might know, or you might know that they know. And we find that their group size really doesn't matter that much at all. What really matters is what everybody knows. When it's common knowledge, when we all know that, you know, there's an emergency or that someone needs to help with something, then group size matters. And game theoretically, that group size effect can also be predicted on a strategic view. Basically, it gets a bit more complicated, but the idea is simply that if there are many people, you don't want to just, you know, help all the time. Like if we all have common knowledge, what you want to do is you want to help with some probability that depends on the full number of people available to help. So basically, I think the strategic view is a more parsimonious explanation of both the standard group size effect, which has been replicated many times, but also these interesting effects where people, like you said, try to get out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, okay, so, and since we are talking about the bystander effect and helping other people, there's also this connection between common knowledge and charitability, right? C- could you right. tell us about that? Yeah, so um, I find this work really interesting because, you know, at the end of the day, we want people to give to charities and we should just be happy if they do so. But there's this interesting, almost like a bug in psychology where we think that people who give and they want a lot of fame and credit are bad people. And the problem with that is that it might discourage those people from giving because maybe they do want to be famous for giving. (laughs) Um, And but if they think that other people are going to think that they're bad for seeking that fame, then they might just not give at all. So, you know, why do we do that? Well, we think that this puzzle can be explained by thinking about the way in which we try to generally find out who to cooperate with. We want to find good partners in social life who are, um, you know, reliable, but also genuinely good people. You know, they're not going to just take as much as they can get. And then when it's their chance to give, you know, run away. So um, we think that one way in which you can find out whether someone is a good partner is not just by how much they give, but the way in which they give. And um, specifically, we think that if the donor is trying to create common knowledge about their gift, then, you know, it might be that they're trying to make sure that everybody knows that, you know, they're a good person. Um, They're trying to basically get direct reciprocity from the person that they gave to and also indirect reciprocity from everyone else who might see that they did a good thing. So in a couple of studies, what we did is we varied the way in which the donor gives. So sometimes they would give to someone and they would stay anonymous. Other times they would give to someone, they would find out who they're giving to, but they wouldn't tell that person their own identity. Sometimes they would do the reverse. So they would tell the person, who they are, but they wouldn't want to know who that person was. And by and large, what we found is that people think that you're more charitable if your gift is not trying to get some kind of favor in return. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we also find a number of other interesting effects. But I think that's the main one, which is that the way in which you give, the knowledge you create says something about you and that is reflected in people's charitability judgment. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, so let's just talk about one last topic and now circling all the way back to morality and moral behavior. 
what is the relationship between common knowledge and moral behavior? Is it that common knowledge, uh, let's say, increases people's morality in some way? I mean, that it makes people more moral to have common knowledge or, or not? Yeah, so this is an interesting question about, you know, what function does common knowledge play in moral life? And yeah. one hypothesis that we have is that, you know, if you're in a society, you're trying to keep everybody coordinated without having too many unnecessary fights and struggles because that's costly, you know. So it's really important to be able to coordinate between different disputes. So if someone does something wrong, you want to just efficiently deal with that so that it doesn't escalate and create more problems and so forth. <laughs> and one idea is that common knowledge is a very good way of doing that. So if someone does something that's clearly wrong, like if they openly steal and it's filmed on camera, then if we all have the norm that stealing is wrong, we can all coordinate against that person and we can say, look, what you did is wrong and we can punish them. And there's less chance that that person will be able to convince others that actually they were right and, you know, this whole thing could escalate. So the idea then is that that tendency to want to coordinate easily in these disputes might even influence which kinds of moral norms we have in the first place. So as you probably know, people think that harms of commission, you know, when you do something that's clearly observable, like you took someone's food away, are worse than harms of omission. So you didn't do anything. And, and it's not clear, you know, why people care about that, because in both cases, the outcome is still the same. So another way of putting it, it, putting it is that on a utilitarian view, the outcomes are the same in that everybody is harmed as the same amount. But on a deontological view, it's different because in one case you deliberately stole and in the other case you just did nothing. So the thought is that maybe the cases of commission where you're doing something are very good at creating common knowledge. So, you know, if you do that, then it's very easy for us to all say, okay, you, you clearly did something wrong. Um, and so those might become norms because they're much easier for us to coordinate around. It would be like having a traffic light that's very bright versus one that is just very murky. You, you probably just ignore the murky one because it's just going to create trouble. And um, I think that, that this can start to explain a lot of interesting quirks of social life. For instance, mobbing on social media. You know, someone posts something. And one thing about social media is that if they said something that violates the norm, within a day or two, they could get a million, you know, ugly tweets from everybody who hates them. And one reason might be that people assume that because it's on social media, it's common knowledge. So they feel safe coordinating against that person. Whereas if only they knew, they might not be the first one to sort of throw stones because maybe no one will join them. So in general, we think that there might be a link between common knowledge and morality, which is that common knowledge helps people to efficiently coordinate against wrongdoers. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, with this knowledge uh, or by studying the role that common knowledge plays in moral behavior, as you said, it's also easier to understand probably where some moral norms come from or stem from, right? Yeah. Like I said, it's still a hypothesis, um, but it does start to at least make sense of why we have some norms and not others. You know, on the surface, a philosopher might be, might rightfully be puzzled over why we don't have norms like minimize the maximum number of deaths, which is a very, very utilitarian view. Instead, it seems like a lot of our moral psychology is deontological. Don't steal. You know, don't um, have sex before marriage. You know, there are these, these very discrete acts that can sort of be pointed to and that you can get other people to sort of point to with you and uh, sort of get people to coordinate 
against. And um, that's important in, in part because, you know, sometimes when there are conflicts, you know, maybe someone expects you to side with them because you're their friend, you know, or um, there, there could be so many ways that you could take sides, you know. But the problem with that is that there might end up being more problems if you don't take sides with the majority. So if we can all just agree who the wrong person is, then we can efficiently sort out the problem before it escalates. Um, but of course, this could be also problematic because in many cases, we should be thinking in more utilitarian ways. For instance, if there are more deaths because no one's doing anything, that is still a very morally problematic course of action. And just because we don't feel outraged by it or we can't blame anyone doesn't mean that we're not doing a morally wrong that needs to be rectified. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let me just ask you one last question because we've been talking both or at least we've focused much more on how people think about um, Say about the self, about moral behavior, about common knowledge and things like that, how they coordinate their behavior. Um, but, uh, I mean, on the other hand, there's also the question of people's, if people's intuitions really correspond to something real. But now I want to ask you something different. Do you think that these beliefs that people have, independently of them being correct or not, that they are really the causes behind uh, the different types of behavior that go associated with them, or that it occurs mostly at, for example, the subconscious level and the beliefs that the explicit, let's say, beliefs that people hold that people are good or bad and this and that are only, let's say, some sort of epiphenomena. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say the answer is more or less clear depending on the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, just starting with the common knowledge and knowledge situations, there it really seems as though the kind of knowledge states that people have affect their behavior. So we find that people's willingness to coordinate when they have real money on the line for instance, really depends on what they believe everybody knows, um, you know, their willingness to help in a situation where there are multiple bystanders as well, actually affects the decisions that they make in their behavior. Yeah. In other cases, like the um, true self, the evidence is less clear, but we do have some studies that suggest that at least in certain circumstances, people's intuitions about your good essence can sort of bubble up and affect behavior. So just to give you an example, um, in one study, we reminded people about the true self, and we wanted to see whether that would lead them to view others who normally are considered part of their art group more positively, and maybe donate more money to members of that group than they would normally. And what we found is if you first remind them about the true self, then they're actually more likely to give more money to a charity such as, um, in, in at least the study was done in the US, so it was the Syrian Arab Red Crescent versus, um, I think, the, the Red Cross or something like that. So they were more likely to give to um, a sort of uh, outgroup charity than they would normally. Um, but, you know, I think I want to say that in some ways there we're we're sort of reminding them about this intuition, which potentially m most of the time might not affect their behavior, you know. Um, of course, it's, it's the fact that we often treat others pretty badly. Um, so the power there might be in using this sort of deeper intuition to guide behavior. Um, and then a lot of the other studies, we've mostly measured people's moral judgments. Um, so, or judgments about things that are affected by moral judgments like happiness or weakness of will or blame. We haven't tested whether that goes on to affect how you would treat them, which I think is an interesting question. Um, I guess a priori, I don't see why if you think that, you know, someone is more blameworthy, for instance, that you wouldn't also 
actually punish them more if given them if given the chance. But it's certainly possible that in some of these cases, it's more of a a way in which the system works, but not necessarily affects behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. De Freitas, uh, just before we go, would you like to tell people what are the best places on the internet for them to find your work, particularly the topics we've been talking about here and the rest as well? Oh, sure, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I've got a website. It's uh, www.juliandefreitas.com. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm also on Twitter, not too often. Um, I've got a Google Scholar. So I think the obvious places, uh, if you search, I'm sure you'll find the papers. I try to put them out on, on the web. And of course, all my co-authors, you know, they have really interesting programs, not all of which involve me. So I'd also check them out. Yeah. Okay, so I will be leaving links in the description box of the interview with all of that, your links to your work and other stuff. And uh, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. And it was really fun to talk to you. Thank you. Ricardo, likewise. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. And to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. And I also have links to PayPal in the description box of the interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and main supporters, Karin Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Anian Kata, Jacob Klimpi, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalanias, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, Bo Weingard, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windiger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Marco Neves, Max Belby, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spigny, Phil Kavanagh, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Mikkel Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugney, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Felicia Stevens, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Labrant, Os Oslem Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, Sardus France, David Sloan Wilson, and the Asila Deza Araujo, my producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Dr. Ian Gilligan, Sergio Quadriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Van Egdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Verge, Vega Gidi, and my executive producers, Michel Rogieski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.